All right. There we go. <laughs> okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Rowan Schwartz. I'm the Executive Administrative Assistant with the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Uh, I'll be here as a resource for any tech difficulties that you may have with the webinar. Um, I'll be helping with dropping things in the chat. Uh, <laughs> And I will also be monitoring my email, uh, which will also be in the chat for any issues that you may be having. Uh, we're using the webinar function on Zoom today, so we're not able to see you or hear you, but we are so glad that you're here. And thank you for coming to the first session of our uh, Domestic Violence for Mental Health Providers series. This is an updated version of the webinar series that we hosted in 2015. And a few housekeeping notes, uh, this webinar will be recorded and shared to our YouTube channel. Um, and then uh, if you're wanting CEUs from this webinar, you must be attending the live session uh, today, March 2nd, 10 a.m. because uh, this is going on YouTube. So, uh, but uh, once this webinar is over, you'll need to fill out an evaluation and email it back to me by Wednesday, March 9th at 5 p.m. in order to receive your certificate. And again, my email will be in the chat um, and I'll remind you all before we log off today. Um, a note on accessibility, we were unfortunately unable to get a Spanish interpreter for this morning. Uh, I found out earlier this morning that the organization had no one to fill in, um, but we do have closed captioning available. Um, uh, if you uh, go down to the um, bottom of your screen, there is a button with CC in a box, um, and you should be able to access the uh, live transcript through there. Um, and then, uh, so before we start, I know we have participants joining us from all around the US, so I wanna share a little bit about the Oregon Coalition. We are Oregon's dual sexual and domestic violence coalition based in Portland, Oregon. Our coalition promotes equity, social change in order to end violence for all communities. We seek to transform society by engaging diverse voices, supporting the self-determination of survivors and providing leadership for advocacy efforts. And we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and honor the land that the coalition is on, sending appreciation, gratitude, and apology to the people of the Multnomah, the Clackamas, and the Chinook, and as well as many, many other tribal nations whose land that we benefit from being on. Um, and we'd just like to honor their ancestors and the descendants of uh, those tribes. And then without further ado, uh, Chris, go ahead and take it away. Thanks. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Chris Huffine. I'm a licensed psychologist here in Portland, Oregon. And just a little bit about me and uh, we'll kind of go from, from there. Um, I've been working with abusive partners for the past 30 years, uh, initially uh, at Men's Resource Center in Portland, Oregon. And then for the past 17 plus years to Allies in Change. I've worked with thousands of abusive partners. I've also worked uh, with survivors of domestic violence, hundreds of survivors and heard from hundreds of survivors over the years. Um, there's been an area of expertise of mine. And um, uh, besides directly doing groups for abusive uh, partners, I'm the executive director of Allies in Change. Um, I also do trainings from around the country. I am part of the uh, have been part of the Oregon State Domestic Violence Fatality Review Team that has historically reviewed a couple domestic homicides a year to see what we can learn from that and improve our responses to domestic violence. I've also been part of the uh, state standards group that in Oregon that established standards for programs that work with abusive partners. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, Allies and Change is a private nonprofit uh, adult counseling center. Uh, and besides our individual and couples work, um, we also work a lot with abusive partners. Um, and we have about 30 groups right now that we offer, um, all of them currently online, although that of course will gradually be moving back to in-person. We offer groups for men who have been abusive, groups for women who have been abusive and one multi-gender LGBTQ plus group. Uh, and our groups are longer term. Typically people in order to complete our program are attending for nine to 12 months or even longer. Uh, another noteworthy thing about uh, our groups is that we have a, a large number of voluntary clients um, and we offer uh, four or five groups that are all voluntary. 
and about 70 of our uh, attendees are voluntary. That's more than any other agencies working within the country, as far as I know, in terms of people who are choosing to attend voluntarily. Uh, most programs work primarily with people who are court involved, either they've got a domestic violence charge against them, they, uh, child welfare is involved and, and require them to get services or as part of a custody evaluation or a divorce agreement. And we do offer one group for survivors, female identified survivors of domestic violence a support group. And then we offer professional trainings and workshops. I also wanna mention uh, a book uh, to, uh, that I came out with in the fall, Becoming Allies. This is actually a book for abusive partners. Um, so it's for people who have done abusive behavior. Um, it, there aren't a lot of books out there for abusive partners. Uh, there's something that I've been aware of for many years and so felt moved to write such a book. Um, it's quite extensive. It runs almost 500 pages. It's more like a textbook. And uh, it's also, I think, appropriate for people who wanna better understand domestic violence. So for all of you who are attending today, if you wanna do some additional reading, um, there'll be a few books that I mentioned, one of which is Becoming Allies. Um, uh, it's also a great book to refer to people who are, who are wrestling with their abusive behavior. Um, in particular. There are no pronouns used, are there gender neutral pronouns used in the book? So uh, that was done very intentionally. Uh, as I'll talk, well, we know that most abusive partners are male identified. We do have female identified abusive partners. We also, of course, have domestic violence in LGBTQ plus relationships. And so the book was written willfully to, so that people don't have to do any kind of pronoun switching or adjusting, depending on their gender identification or their sexual orientation or what have you. Uh, and you can purchase this online as an ebook or as a hard copy book um, through typical uh, uh, platforms like Amazon and, and uh, what have you. Um, so that's just kind of like PBS, a little bit of the, you know, you get a little bit of the pr promo at the beginning, and then we'll jump in. Um, this is the first of four webinars that are going to be offered every other week. Uh, for the next uh, six weeks, if you will, going forward from here. Uh, the one for today is really an overview of domestic violence. Uh, the one in two weeks will be discussing how to screen for domestic violence in your individuals and couples and families and assess for it. Uh, and then the one a month from now, the third one will be on how to intervene when you've got clients who are uh, involved in abusive behavior, whether on the, on the giving end or the receiving end, as you will. Um, how to work with them as a mental health professional and deal with that. And then the final one in the series, we're gonna broaden it out. It won't just be myself presenting, there'll be a couple other presenters co-presenting with me as well. And that'll be around safety planning. So uh, ultimately uh, you're welcome to attend all four. Um, they'll each be for two uh, CEUs and then all four will ultimately be available through the Oregon Coalition website. And uh, please uh, promote this webinar, uh, get your colleagues and folks out there to watch this, um, uh, especially if you find it valuable. All righty. And then I want to acknowledge uh, Janie Perlstein, who um, is the one other person you can see. Uh, she is a uh, uh, employee at Allies and Change and has been with us for a couple years now. And she'll be overseeing the chat and also um, answering questions and things of that nature uh, that may come up as well. Um, so you're welcome as we're going along. If you have questions or comments, feel free to share them through the chat or through the Q&A. Uh, I'm also aware that, that there are some folks I believe attending today who are very knowledgeable themselves about domestic violence. And of course, you all are welcome to come, chime in with your comments or questions, or if there's things you disagree with or you know, want to elaborate on that I'm sharing, feel free, please, to do that. Um, so, uh, the warning I want to give you, uh, well, a couple, one is that, you know, you're gonna be hearing my opinions and my perspectives. Uh, this is obviously an area of expertise, uh, but it's still just my perspective and you're welcome to disagree or take anything I say with a grain of salt, important for that. Um, also, uh, but the other warning I want to make is that, that for some of you, especially some of you who have not had his extensive training in domestic violence. This may be a more troubling uh, presentation, especially today's presentation than you anticipated. Um, because hearing this stuff, you may realize that your understanding of domestic violence has been very, very narrow, much more narrow than it 
than is actually the case of what really involves domestic violence. And in realizing that, you may uh, realize that there are clients that you either currently are working with or have worked with in the past that actually now in hindsight, oh my gosh, that was an abusive relationship. You know, oh my gosh, I had no idea this is making so much more sense now. And so uh, that could happen. And then perhaps even more troubling is you may realize, oh no, this is what my sister's in. Oh no, this is what I'm in. And we've had this experience before. So I, I want to just uh, uh, you know, make you aware of that and to take care of yourself in the ways that you need to be. Um, here's a quote from Maya Angelou that I think is very relevant. I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. So I really appreciate all of you attending today. Um, historically, uh, mental health professionals get very little training in domestic violence. Um, and uh, it's a huge and glaring oversight in our professional development in general. And I appreciate all you all being here today to hopefully increase your knowledge and understanding. So uh, again, just a few stats, I'm not gonna share a bunch, um, but just at least to go and kind of orient us, domestic violence is a significant issue uh, in this country and around the world. First in this country, uh, we know that approximately one in three women will be physically assaulted by a romantic partner at some point in their lifetime. Um, so kind of the classic way of thinking that if you, this is a woman, if you're a woman and there's a woman to your left and a woman to your right, chances are, odds are one of the three of you has experienced, either has experienced or will experience a, a physical assault. We know among women who are murdered, about a third of women who are killed are killed by an intimate partner. Um, and we also know there's a significant connection between stalking and domestic homicide. Uh, most of the women who, who, who are murdered by a romantic, current or former romantic partner were stalked prior to being murdered. Uh, of course, no surprise, the fact that a lot of domestic violence that's illegal does not get reported. Only about half of all physical assaults get reported. And in general, uh, domestic violence, I call it an equal opportunity employer. It, it, we see it across every race, every class, every sexual orientation, every occupation, every religious practice, every country. Um, the one significant difference uh, is around gender. And we know the vast majority of perpetrators of domestic violence are cis heterosexual males. And the vast majority of victims of domestic violence are cis heterosexual females. Of course, again, there is domestic violence in LGBTQ relationships and so forth and so on. There are uh, heterosexual women that commit domestic violence. There are heterosexual men that are abused um, as well, but it skews strongly along gendered lines. And that data is really quite strong and compelling, um, if you will. Uh, a quick question from uh, Sharon. Uh, she wanted to uh, clarify, did Oregon only have two domestic violence deaths? She said no. in Maryland there were 48 people no. uh -uh. by DV last year. No, I don't know what the exact number were last year in Oregon. No, it's a lot more than two. So no, I, I didn't say anything about domestic homicides in Oregon. So I'm not sure what you may have misheard, but I haven't talked about Oregon specific stats. I'm talking about in general, perhaps what you misheard is in general, but this is across the country. One in three women across the country will experience at least one physical assault from a romantic partner at some point in their adult lives. So children are also significantly impacted by domestic violence. Um, and what we're talking about right now are not children who are directly physically abused by an abusive partner. That does happen, of course. Uh, but in addition to that, what we know is that some people who abuse their partners do not directly physically abuse their children, okay? So not all the people who abuse their partner physically abuse their children physically, all right? Um, uh, but what is much more common is that I would suggest to you that any children in an abusive home are being negatively impacted by that. Uh, by that domestic violence. And so here are a few uh, quick stats related to that. It's been estimated that between 40 to 80% of children in domestically violent homes have witnessed at least one episode of abuse. That means they've either, either seen it or they've heard it. Um, and in general, now we're talking about children in general in the United States, it's estimated about a quarter of all children will be exposed to family violence at some point in their life. Okay. 
uh, where things get much more grim is the impact on children. Uh, what we know is witnessing abusive behavior, being exposed to abusive behavior can be as damaging as being directly physically or sexually abused. Okay, so one chilling study found that the brain uh, activity pattern of children who had been exposed to domestic violence was similar to combat soldiers. Okay, all right, so that was a few stats for you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a couple uh, resources. Uh, one um, is that web address that'll give you more information about uh, women, uh, children who, who have witnessed domestic violence. Another great resource that came out about 20 years ago now, but I think it's still very relevant, uh, came out of Canada called Little Eyes, Little Ears. It's a PDF. And uh, if you'd like to get a copy of that, I'd be happy to forward one to you. You can email me. If I thought about it, I would have shared that information ahead of time so we could post it in the chat. Um, but it's a, it's a great, uh, and that little eyes, little ears is for professionals. So it provides extensive information about the common impacts on children and how children at different ages will show the impact of domestic violence exposure differently and common ways they display it and things of that nature. So those are a couple other resources to learn more about how children who are exposed to domestic violence are affected. Uh, domestic violence is, is present around the world. Um, and so I'm going to skip through these slides quickly. The exact, uh, the exact uh, level um, will vary a little bit from country to country. Uh, <clears throat> but the point here is it happens everywhere. Um, if you look at this uh, slide here, what you can see is um, the darker the green, the higher the rates of domestic violence, um, if you will. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is, uh, and, and now this is specific to this country, although I think that this has some relevance again around the world, is when we look at who's getting arrested for domestic violence, what we find is that uh, it's disproportionately uh, working class men and men of color. Um, and uh, if you look at the stats uh, around this, this is what you're going to find. And that can lead to the erroneous presumption that it's more common among working class people or more common in communities of color. Um, and uh, that's not necessarily the case. That's not the case. Uh, when we look at data that's more about general population surveys, we see some of those uh, differences uh, going away. So it's very important that we uh, not see this as a working class issue or as an issue that's uh, more rampant in communities of color, it's, it's also very much an issue within wealthier folks and dominant culture folks in the United States. Um, but why is it that, you know, we look at who gets arrested? Well, there are a lot of reasons why. Um, people who are abusive, uh, who are wealthier, may not need to resort to physical tactics. They can resort to verbal, emotional, economic tactics. Part of it is practical, is that um, if you're wealthier, you're going to have more privacy. You're more likely to be a homeowner rather than live in an apartment. Um, also, likewise, the quality of your home is going to be higher quality, uh, better soundproofing, a larger lot, which means others are less likely to witness or be exposed to or overhear what's happening. So they won't know or realize that they need to call the police. Um, also, uh, in general, the criminal justice system tends to uh, be quicker to give a pass to dominant culture folks in terms of prosecution, things of that nature. Um, also, uh, people who are wealthier can find other ways to get out of those arrests. Um, we also find that uh, the abused partners who are wealthier um, may pursue other avenues to get safe besides involving the police. Um, and uh, finally, I think a significant one, and I could argue that this perhaps is the number one reason, is, there, is, is there's greater consequences if you're wealthier. And what I mean by that is that uh, if I'm working you know, at McDonald's making minimum wage, and I've been working there six months and I get arrested on a domestic violence charge, the financial impact on me is probably gonna be hundreds of dollars, maybe a few thousand. That's a lot, you know, especially if I'm making you know, minimum wage, but I'm not losing that much. On the other hand, if I'm a professional, getting a domestic violence charge against me um, could cost me tens of thousands of dollars in lost work income. It could affect my career. It could affect my reputation. Uh, right now in Portland, uh, in, in the press, there's a former player um, uh, for the Portland professional soccer team 
that is uh, the Timbers that has allegations of domestic violence. The team let him go. Uh, and, you know, the impact on him is huge. Where I'm going with this is that what I've observed over the years is the more someone has to lose, the more motivated they are not to get arrested and get a criminal charge against them. This is, by the way, in general, true for crime in general. What that means for people who are abusive is that they're less likely to do illegal abuse. In other words, what they're going to do is they're going to primarily do abuse that they can't get arrested for. Okay, and that's what we see in our voluntary groups. We have a lot of wealthier uh, people who are attending who are virtually never physically abusive, so they can't get arrested. And I'll circle back around to this in a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so let's talk about what is domestic violence, what we mean by domestic violence. And here's a classic common definition of domestic violence. It's a pattern or course of behavior used by one person to control and subordinate another in an intimate relationship. This specific one comes out of the Oregon Domestic Violence Council about 25 years ago or so they came out with this. But this is a very typical kind of definition that you see. And, and I like it. I think it works just fine. So we're going to dive deeper into this to really sharpen up your understanding. Speaking for myself, by the way, um, Back in the day when I was in graduate school, I had a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of domestic violence education. And I thought domestic violence involved physical abuse, severe beatings, you know, severely maiming, maybe even killing a partner. Um, and that these were really bad perpetrators and that the victims were often going into shelter. So that was my understanding of domestic violence. And of course, I've grown a lot since then and learned a lot. Um, and the first part is this idea of coercive behavior. What are we talking about with coercive behavior? So most obviously includes physical abuse, hitting, kicking, slapping, pushing, shoving, things of that nature. It also includes being physically controlling, grabbing somebody, holding them down, restraining them. The way we define it broadly at our agency is any kind of unwanted physical contact, regardless of whether it causes injury or even pain. Okay. So, for example, if I pin my partner against the wall, um, I may not injure them, and they may not actually be even feeling physical pain as I do that. That is still physical violence. That is still physical abuse. So, again, the legal definitions tend to be much more narrow because they have to be to clearly define what they're going to arrest for, whereas the real-world definitions tend to be much broader. So physical abuse includes any kind of unwanted physical contact. Verbal abuse is pretty obvious. It's name calling, put downs, you know, tearing somebody apart with words, you know, being derogatory towards them, swearing at them, yelling at them, things of that nature. Psychological abuse, uh, also sometimes called emotional abuse. And so typically I equate emotional abuse and psychological abuse. I use those terms synonymously. They involve nonverbal behavior that creates fear and intimidation, things like looks, stares, gestures. Um, and, and there's also a more subtle form of psychological abuse uh, that I call radiating intensity. So this is a term that I coined, and let me explain this to you more. This is a more subtle uh, example of emotional abuse. Um, so radiating intensity uh, describes the circumstances in which the person is not being overtly abusive in any way. So there's nothing that they're doing, um, like yelling, they're not throwing things, they're not hitting anybody. Um, but they are significantly unhappy. They are in an unhappy place. Uh, and they are subtly blaming their family for it. So it's kind of like, uh, without saying it, they're kind of ready, don't fuck with me. You don't want to fucking fuck with me right now. I'm about to fucking blow. And it's not that they ever actually lose it. It's very important to understand this. And it's, it's not that they actually then become abusive in an overt way. They mean actually not. But just this intensity which is conveyed in very subtle ways through a variety of micro behaviors puts the rest of the family on edge, okay? And so it can be things like the way I fold my newspaper as I'm reading it, the way I enter the room. One quote I've heard from multiple survivors is we knew what kind of night it would be by the sound of his tires as he pulled into the driveway, okay? That's radiating intensity, okay? And so the, uh, and so the family's on eggshells, okay? Even though there's nothing overtly done, so this is like a bad mood on steroids, but it's not the same thing as being in the bad mood. So all of us have our off days. I think all of us have probably been grumpy once in a while or in a bad mood once in a while. And typically when, you know, common qualities of being in a bad mood is, you know, you're not as polite, you may frown, you may be quieter, you know, you're just not in as warm a state. 
And usually the normal kind of response to having a family member on in a bad mood is, you know, is kind of, you know, a respectful distancing, perhaps a little compassion, maybe a little bit of amusement. Hey, kids, you may want to steer clear of mom this morning. She didn't sleep very well last night and she's not in the best of spaces. That's a bad mood. Radiating intensity is like a bad mood on steroids. It's like a bad mood plus blame. Um, and they feel very differently. I'm, I'm sure that we've got people attending today who are survivors that you have to self-identify or anything like that. But if you share this concept with the survivors, if you talk with them more about this thing, you're going to start to see a lot of heads nod um, uh, and relate to this. There are some families where this is the primary thing that's happening. Okay. So I've worked with a, a number of families where there's no, there's never been any, there's never been any physical abuse. And there's actually very little uh, overt verbal abuse, but there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on. A lot of, he's often unhappy and it often feels like it's our fault. And we're often on edge having to deal with this. So again, it's not the same thing as having a depressed partner or a grumpy partner. Okay. This is significantly and quali qualitatively different than that because of this sense of blame. And hopefully uh, this will make even more sense over the course of the of this webinar, uh, what I'm talking about with this. It's all tied together, hopefully in ways that are clear. Property abuse includes throwing things, breaking things, uh, slamming doors, punching walls, banging on stuff. We code it as property abuse, even if they're abusing their own property, and even if the property is not damaged. So let's say, for example, that uh, I'm working on my car and I throw my wrench across the garage. Um, it's my wrench and the wrench is not damaged, that would still be coded as property abuse. The reason why we care about property abuse so much <clears throat> is that <clears throat> witnessing it is often psychologically uh, damaging. So uh, even if I, I'm not directly targeting my family, if they see me abuse property, it's gonna go and affect them uh, in, a, in a bad way. Um, it can also be witnessing the aftermath of it. So in other words, if my family comes home and they see a new hole in the wall, they're gonna immediately get anxious. Oh shit, oh shit. Oh shit, they didn't witness me punching the wall, but they can see that I do did and they know what that means and it's not good. Financial abuse uh, is one that requires a lot more explanation, uh, way more than I have today to, to offer it. I've got, I think a couple slides that list all the examples, a lots of different examples of financial abuse. Financial abuse primarily happens in relationships with a shared income. So it's more rare when people are just dating and have separate incomes and, and they aren't financially interwoven. But once a relationship becomes financially interwoven, that's where financial abuse often will happen. And these are all examples. There's a whole chapter in my book that outlines in detail, explains each of these in, in more detail, um, if you will. So I've got three different slides. So that's a whole nother realm. Uh, we find this quite common among our abusive partners, some forms of financial abuse. And then sexual abuse um, is the other one that requires a lot more elaboration than I have for, for today. Uh, typically, when people hear sexual abuse, the automatic thing we think of is rape, like physically forcing yourself on somebody or abusing a child sexually. And of course, those both qualify. But, my, but the reality is, is while most abuse, abusive partners have been sexually abusive, they've not been sexually abusive in those ways. Um, it more broadly includes any kind of unwanted sexual contact or sexual harassment. So I've got a couple slides here to list some examples of sexual abuse. This first slide, so some, some of the most common ones among abusive partners. So what I would say in my experience is that uh, a significant majority of uh, abusive partners can check at least one of these that they've done to their romantic partner, to their sexual partner. Not all of them, but nearly all of them can report at least one of these on this slide. And then some other, other ones uh, are on the next slide. Um, broadly defined, we define sexual abuse as any kind of unwanted sexual contact or any kind of violation that uh, evokes sex. So if I verbally abuse somebody, like if I call my wife a, a whore, um, I'm not only even being verbally abusive, I'm being sexually abusive as well. And sexual abuse, there's a whole other layer of injury um, because uh, our sexuality is such a personal part of us, that in particular being uh, a vulnerable part of us, that being targeted tends to be even more hurtful and damaging. Um, and um, uh, the kind of uh, thing that happens when we discuss this in our groups for abusive partners is they'll joke, well, what about BDSM, you know, whips and chains? Is that sexually abusive? 
And that kind of opens up a discussion of kind of this idea of ongoing non-coerced informed consent. So let me say that one more time, ongoing non-coerced informed consent. And while we tend to talk about this most of all with sexual abuse, this applies more generally to any form of abusive behavior. Um, number one is there being consent given, okay? And so the idea is, is in, in BDSM relationships that are healthy um, and mutual, they're giving consent. Um, so they're giving permission, which changes things. Um, but consent alone is not enough. You need to be informed of what you're consenting to. Uh, traveling for work, I'm across the country and I'm married and I take off my wedding ring and I go into a bar and I chat up a, a woman at the bar and she really likes me and she invites me back to her place for sex. She's given consent, but uh, it hasn't been informed consent because there are a couple of things that she doesn't realize. Um, one is that I'm married, uh, which I did not tell her and I hid from her. So she thought I was actually available for dating. And secondly, that I'm a local person, that we could actually, this could be the beginning of a relationship. So she was not looking for a one night stand. She was thinking this could be the beginning of a dating relationship. And I didn't make that clear that I'm married and I don't live anywhere near here. So even though she gave consent, it was not informed consent. That would be considered sexual abuse. I was sexually abusing her. I took advantage of her sexually. And that needs to be non-coerced, which means it needs to be okay to say no. So even if you know what you're saying yes to, if there are penalties for you saying no, then it's coerced. So it's not true consent. And then it's ongoing. In other words, just because I say yes at point A, I can say no at any point thereafter. It isn't a permanent forever yes. It needs to be ongoing consent, which can be withdrawn at any point. So ongoing non-coerced informed consent. Uh, there's a great, uh, very popular YouTube video called uh, Pizza as Consent or Tea as Consent. Two variations of this, Tea as Consent or Pizza as Consent. And um, each one um, in, in just like three minutes covers what I've just talked about um, in, in nice, clear detail. And they're appropriate for like teenagers and adults um, and so forth and so on. So, all right. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about culture today um, in part because uh, this is an issue in every, people of every cultural background. Um, however, I want to acknowledge in part the fact that there are culturally specific forms of abuse. So first, let me clarify what I mean by culture just very briefly, because sometimes when people think of culture, they think of race, and I'm referring to it much more broadly um, in terms of uh, culture. Um, and so we've got, uh, you know, your, your, your sexual orientation, uh, where you were born, what your age is, uh, your, your social class, and the point here is um, any culture that you're a part of, there may be uh, culture-related forms of abuse that people that are outside of that culture would not understand as being abusive, okay? So there may be certain words or phrases that I could use that are derogatory within our culture that because you don't share that culture, you don't understand it derogatory. There may be certain gestures or certain other ways that I might intervene in terms of the way a person dresses or a way a person behaves that to you, if you're not part of this culture, may not realize is actually very derogatory, but it is within our culture. Um, now you can't know all those. Um, there's no way you can know all the cultural specific forms of abuse, but part of this is being uh, more open to the general mindset and seeing that that way. Um, now I did notice somebody asking in the chat, I'm kind of loosely monitoring it, about other forms of abuse. So, so uh, Rebecca was asking about spiritual abuse or digital abuse. And so let me talk just briefly about that. There are lots of different ways you can slice the pie of abusive behavior. So I'm not telling you the categories of abusive behavior. I'm describing to you the ways that, that I divide these things up. Um, if you look at the power and control wheel, which is kind of the most well-known divvying up of abusive behaviors. You'll see that that divides abusive behaviors up a little bit differently. Um, uh, in terms of spiritual abuse, spiritual abuse refers to um, uh, people using religious, uh, focusing on religious practices as abusive. That covers a wide area of things. It includes um, both using your spiritual practice to be abusive 
as well as blocking or controlling somebody from accessing their spiritual practices. That's very briefly what that is. Digital abuse, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not as familiar with that, but I'm assuming that refers to online types of things, use of social media and things of that nature. Now, well, the way we capture those is we capture those under our other categories. So the, the main point is there are lots of ways you can slice this pie. Um, and uh, uh, there's no one right way of slicing it, um, but those are some examples of some other ways uh, of being abusive, if you will. Um, the other one that I don't actually have a slide on, but since that got raised, I'll mention in passing. The other one that we've coined that we ask in our groups that I don't have a slide on is collateral abuse, okay? Collateral abuse refers to abusive behavior where the victim is not the intended target, okay? So collateral abuse refers to somebody who's negatively affected by the abuse who is not the intended target. The most obvious and largest group of people that, that would fall under that heading are children in the home, okay? So for example, if I call my wife a bitch and my six-year-old hears that, I was verbally abusive to, to, to my wife and my six-year-old experienced collateral abuse. I didn't call my six-year-old a name. Maybe I've never called my six-year-old a name, but them hearing me call their mother a name is gonna cause them suffering and, and, and struggle. And so we call that as collateral abuse. So that's one we use in our groups. Um, and it's an important one to really kind of um, <clears throat> increase understanding of, it's not just who you're targeting, it's who actually witnesses it, who's exposed to it. That could include most obviously children, it could include neighbors, it could include other family members who's, who are present, strangers that are walking by or happen by. So that's an example of, a, of another slice that we kind of carve out at allies that most agencies don't in that way, you know, um, which is fine. You know, again, there are lots of different ways you can kind of describe this stuff. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So another, another whole realm of, of abuse that almost never gets talked about. So I know that some of you here uh, who are attending this ha have had some good training in domestic violence, others you've not as much. This is an example that even those who have had good training in domestic violence may not have had much training on this, which is relational neglect, okay? And so relational neglect is a more subtle form of mistreatment. It's, not about, it's typically more not about what you are doing, but what you're not doing, okay? And um, uh, the easiest way to kind of grasp this is when we talk about child abuse, when we started to really focus in more on child abuse, what we started realizing is besides the obvious ways of abusing a child, you can hit them, you can beat them, you know, you can lock them in a closet. There's also ways that you, you can also cause a lot of damaging by neglecting them by not meeting their basic needs, by not keeping them safe, by not feeding them, by not adequately sheltering them. So now we talk about child abuse and child neglect. And we acknowledge that neglect is also a serious issue. Well, likewise, there's relational neglect, okay, is what we're talking about. And this is much more subtle, it's much less dramatic, but it's hugely damaging and toxic. Okay, now probably the most common form of relational neglect that we see in abusive partners is the non-acknowledgement of the abuse, okay? And this is another part of getting this more into a 201 level thing is rather than a one, you know, 101 level kind of the domestic violence is understanding this concept, okay? So uh, this, is, this is an important thing to understand a significant amount of the damage that I do when I'm being abusive is not the moment that I'm abusive. It's what follows the moments that I'm abusive. And a very, very common pattern is that a person's abusive and then they minimize the abuse, they ignore the abuse, they justify the abuse, they rationalize it, they shift blame, they pretend like it didn't happen, okay? So it's very important that, and that is really what causes the damage to be much deeper. Okay, so uh, part of this is uh, if, I, if I'm abusive in the moment and I acknowledge it and I own it and I validate the person's experience, that doesn't make it okay, but it really can mitigate the negative impact. Uh, on the other hand, if I blame you for it, if I minimize it, if I rationalize it, it makes it that much worse. 
That's one whole realm of mental, relational neglect that is extremely common. And the analogy is if you scrape your knee, there's damage to your knee, but if you notice it and you acknowledge it and you address it, clean it up, put antibiotics on it, that kind of thing, it's much less likely to get infected. On the other hand, if you ignore it, pretend like it didn't happen, move on, it's much more likely to become infected and to cause problems. So that's the most common form of relational neglect we see among abusive partners is um, not, the, not acknowledging what they've done. But that's not the only one, okay? So other general ways of being neglectful in a relationship is not acknowledging the partner, uh, literally not thinking about them. Um, it also can, you know, uh, can include um, not being mindful how they're different um, and not considering their input and preferences. Um, and so <clears throat> the experience of this, if you're on the receiving end, is somewhat different. So the typical classic, if you will, forms of abusive behavior, there's a lot of fear and anxiety. Being on eggshells is very common. Okay. With this, it's about feeling invisible. It's about feeling like you don't matter. It's about feeling like you don't have a voice. Okay. And I'm reminded of the point that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. That's what this is. This is, you don't matter. You don't matter. And I don't have to say that out loud. I can say it with my behaviors. Okay. Um, and I could go on and on. Any of these things I could elaborate on in some detail. Um, but again, I'm trying to cover this stuff as quickly as I can in just two hours. Uh, but, you know, one example I've seen the final straw for some survivors is when they had a medical procedure and their partner did not go with them to the medical procedure. Ah, you'll be fine. I got lots of work to do. And as they sit in that waiting room alone, as they wait for the procedure alone, as they come out of the procedure alone, that's when they realize this is my whole marriage. Right here in this moment, this is my whole marriage. I will not abide by this any longer. Okay, so that's kind of that relational neglect that we're talking about. Um, people talk about narcissism. Let me finish making this point, Janie, and then if you've got something you want to jump in, then uh, you can jump in with that. Um, but I think I want to talk about something that's become very popular lately is narcissistic abuse or variations of that. And I will tell you that drives me a little bit crazy because I think it's redundant. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of low, lowercase n, small n narcissism among abusive partners. The word we use at our agency is egotism to make it clear that's different than narcissistic personality disorder. And then Terrence Real in his books calls it grandiosity. Um, but it's more about just being self-absorbed, but it's not capital N narcissism. It's not capital N narcissistic personality disorder because these folks can be very thoughtful about other people in their lives. They're just neglectful with their families. So go ahead, Janie, if you got something. Yes. Um, let's see. So there are a couple comments on this, but Regina Rooney asked, how do you account for the strategic use of apology by abusive partners? Some people will acknowledge what they did right away, et cetera. Is there a sincerity requirement here that makes the difference? And then Sarah responds, in my experience, the strategic use of apology is an emotional abusive tactic, and the intent of the apology is key is the intent to draw the survivor into the grooming, the quote, honeymoon period, the love bombing, the right. apologies. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think you, you've all captured that very well. So it's just good to be said out loud. Um, here's the thing, anything can be weaponized. Anything can be weaponized into a tactic of abuse. Okay, you give me anything and I can weaponize it. And our abusive partners will. Okay, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that's why when you want to understand domestic violence, you, know, you, you need to not look at the behavior, you need to look at the belief system. It's the belief system that is key. Okay, and we see this regularly. Once the belief system changes, they will use things appropriately. So apologies, when they're appropriate, are genuine. Um, they are accountable um, and they lead to concerted efforts to make real changes so that the uh, inappropriate behavior is stopped, okay? Um, so we could go on about apologies and what is an accountable apology. I talk about that in the book as well, what an accountable apology looks like. Um, pretty much anything I'm mentioning today, almost anything, there's, there's a few things later on, but much of this stuff that I'm talking about today, all that's covered in my book, among other places. Um, so again, 
uh, continue to promote it. I would encourage you to read that um, as well for more information. Okay. So here's a, here's a big point, um, a big point, you know, capital letters or whatever. It's not about the physical abuse. It's not about the physical abuse. Okay. Even in the most seriously, horrifically, physically abusive relationships, um, the vast majority of domestic violence is going to involve non-physical abuse. Okay. And there are many abusive relationships out there that have little to no physical abuse at all. Okay. So let me say that one more time. There are plenty of abusive relationships out there that have no physical abuse at all, even as they are terrorizing their families and destroying their families. Okay. So then let me connect these, these other two dots for you. Most of the laws we have in our country around domestic violence are against physical abuse. Okay. Uh, in Oregon, in order to get a restraint order, you have to either have been physically abused or in, in significant fear for your physical safety to qualify for a restraining order, okay? So given that most of our laws are against physical abuse and most domestic violence does not involve physical abuse, most domestic violence is not illegal. Most domestic violence is not illegal, which means that the police and the courts cannot intervene with most abusive families. They can show up, they can tell them to stop doing it, but they can't make an arrest. They can't do much else. And it drives them crazy, um, but that's the reality of it. So it's very important we understand this. The physical abuse is just the tip of the iceberg. The illegal abuse is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? All right, furthermore, and again, I've heard hundreds and from hundreds and hundreds of survivors over the years. Um, so I've got a large data set here. Even among those who have been severely physically abused, I would say probably 80 to 90%, even of the severely physically abused women have reported the emotional abuse was worse. Almost always that's what I hear. Once in a great while, I've heard a survivor say, no, it was a physical abuse. It was horrible. But most of the time, um, even those who've been very physically abused, they say the emotional abuse was worse. And here are a couple quote, quotes. One, um, uh, was not done for, by a survivor. But we all heard the phrase, I don't know, we all have, but when I was growing up, classic line, sticks and stones will break my bones, the words will never hurt me, right? You learn that as a kid. And the rejoinder to that is sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will break my heart. Okay. And then one survivor, although I've heard this from others as well, said it this way, the physical abuse made me hate him. The emotional abuse made me hate myself. Okay. Um, so it's really important that we understand this. And in fact, even with the physical abuse, the active ingredient of the physical abuse is not the actual abuse, it's the meaning of the abuse, okay? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, let's say I and my partner are walking through the house together, okay? And he and I are talking, and as we're walking and talking, I stumble and fall forward and stumble into him and he falls down and hits his head on the corner of the table. Oh my gosh, are you okay? Oh geez, he's bleeding from now his head from where it hit the corner of the table, right? That's situation number one, okay? He's got physical pain, he's got physical injury, okay? Caused by my body having contact with his body, okay? Situation number two, I and my partner are walking through the house. We're arguing now. I say, no, you don't walk away from me. You come back here now and I shove him. Down he goes, bang, he hits his head on the corner of the table. See what happens when you walk away from me? See what happens? No, get up. We're not done. We're going to talk about this. Okay. In each of these cases, the physical injury is the exact same. Okay. The physical injury is the exact same. Uh, in the first case, I stumbled into my partner. It was done accidentally. In the second case, I willfully shoved my partner down. That makes all the difference in the world. In the first case, she's, you know, he's got the same injury and pain, but is he going to be afraid of me? I don't think so. Is he going to have nightmares about this? I doubt it, right? Um, uh, but in the second case, of course, it has a whole different meaning. So the point here is even with the physical injuries, it's not the injury or the physical pain, it's the meaning of it. It's how it was incurred. Very important. Okay. So, Janie, was there something you're going to jump in on, or are we good? Um, 
Yeah, I, I would just add that. So you just met, talked about relational neglect. There are more subtle, subtle, subtle examples of that situation where somebody accidentally hits, you know, f- falls into the table and then the partner ignores it or doesn't show any care. Another example of abuse, even though they didn't cause the cause the harm. Just wanted to add that in. Great. Thank you. I think that's very relevant. Okay. So uh, if I tell you, um, you know, that I got a knife plunged in my chest, <laughs> and let's say I can show you the scar, would you say that I was physically assaulted? Sure. Sounds like it. Oh, yeah. I had open heart surgery. A surgeon did that. Completely changes it. Okay. I still had the physical pain from, you know, having, you know, a knife in my chest. I had the scar from that, but it was done with my consent, more or less, right? Let's say. Versus if somebody stabs me in the chest uh, without my consent, right? Like I get physically assaulted. So I think it's really important here to understand that even the physical abuse, it's a psychological component. It's the meaning of it that makes all the difference. Okay. Very important to understand. It's, it's the whole idea is to move us away from physical abuse. So uh, trigger warning, if you will. Here's a, an, an intense graphic to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, so this is, if you want to think about verbal abuse, this is what verbal abuse looks like, so to speak, right? Words can be blows. Words can be blows, All right? So an analogy to think about domestic violence. And um, I'm in Oregon, so we have the Cascade Mountains. When you think about the Cascades, uh, you know, you've got, in Oregon, you've got Mount Hood, you've got um, um, Mount Jefferson, to our neighbor in Washington, you've got Mount Adams, you've got Mount St. Helens, you've got Mount Rainier. And so uh, when you think about the Cascades, you can think about these mountains. And the thing about mountains is they're dramatic. They stand out. Your, your attention is immediately drawn to the mountains. On a clear day, we, which is not today here in Portland, on a clear day, especially this time of year, the mountains really pop out because they're covered with snow. They're dramatic. And you know when you're on the mountain, <laughs> it gets very steep. You have switchbacks that you're driving up. That's like the physical abuse and the ugly verbal abuse. It's dramatic. It stands out. Your attention's drawn to it. You know when it's happening, more or less. Okay. But the other part of the Cascades are the foothills. Okay. The foothills um, are not nearly as dramatic. Um, you may not even realize when, when you're in them. Um, but the foothills actually run continuously up and down the West Coast. The Cascades are not a collection of mountains, it's actually a ridge. And the bulk of the land mass is not in the mountains, it's in the foothills. Okay. The foothills is the emotional abuse and the psychological abuse and the control. Not nearly as dramatic, not nearly as obvious, but much more frequent, virtually continual. Okay. So uh, we spend so much time talking about the mountains of domestic violence, the physical abuse, the ugly verbal abuse, but that's not what most domestic violence is. It's in the foothills. That's what you need to be attending to. Okay. All righty. So that's a little bit about what are we talking about in terms of coercive behavior. Now, the next part is used by one person to control and subordinate another. Okay. So let's talk about control. So one of the most common lines that I hear when people say domestic violence is they say domestic violence is about power and control. And uh, I agree that that's certainly part of what domestic violence is about. And we're going to spend a lot more time talking about power and control than typically people do because it's so core. So let me talk about control first. And this is where um, one of the handouts is where we get to the first handout besides the PowerPoint. So there are a series of handouts. And maybe, uh, Janie, maybe you can post the list of controlling behaviors into the chat box right now. Um, But there's a long list of controlling behaviors. Um, that uh, you can access. So you can be looking at that list as I kind of make talk about these next few slides, which is all about controlling behavior. So to be controlling of somebody is to make them act or think in a certain way without them freely choosing to do so, okay? So it's interfering with their freedom and their liberty to make their own choices. <clears throat> um, you can either do this coercively or manipulatively, okay? So Evan Stark, Evan Stark, S, last name is S-T-A-R-K, has written a very well-known book called Coercive Control. came out a number of years ago. It's a fine book. Um, I do have a few, few bones to pick with it, most specifically the title, because to me, it's either redundant 
or too narrow, okay? Because not all controlling behaviors are coercive. Some are manipulative, okay? So coercive controlling behaviors are making somebody do something. And you'll see some examples here in just a moment, like badgering somebody or threatening somebody. Um, well, those will be a couple examples of coercive control, or it can manipulate somebody, which is things like lying to them or withholding information from them or misleading them. So I would say not all controlling behaviors are coercive. They're all violation, but they're either coercive, but most are either coercive or manipulative. Almost all controlling behaviors can fall into one of those two categories, either coercive or manipulation. Each of which interferes with the person's freedom of choice. Okay. Now, controlling behaviors, I will tell you, among all the concepts that I talk about, among all the information that we cover in our groups for people, understanding what it means to be controlling is one of the most difficult concepts to understand. In my own professional development, way back in the day, it took me months of being in the group, you know, as a, as a facilitator to really understand this at the very beginning of my training. So a lot of this stuff I got, you know, I got very quickly. It pretty, makes pretty good sense. This, it took me a while to really understand. And that's been my experience with most people educating them. This is not a one and done kind of conversation. Okay. So here are some of the reasons why it's hard to understand. All of us are occasionally controlling. So if you are looking at that list of controlling behaviors, um, uh, you know, you're going to see behaviors that you've done, right? Um, so I'll give a, um, uh, for example, something that I do at times is I interrupt. Interrupting is on the list. I am occasionally controlling. I occasionally interfere with a person's freedom to make their full point, and I will cut them off. Okay. So we all are occasionally controlling. Okay. What we're concerned about is when there are significant patterns of control. Okay. So uh, people who do not have issues with abuse and control behavior, you know, I'll be controlling here by interrupting my partner. I'll be controlling over there by withholding a piece of information. I'll be controlling here um, by uh, not, by keeping my silence, you know, rather than saying my thoughts. Drop a rain, drop a rain, drop a rain, you know. Technically, if you get hit by three drops of rain, you feel like you're getting, you know, you're getting wet technically, but does it really feel like you're getting wet? To be in a controlling relationship where there are ongoing patterns of controlling behaviors like being in a rainstorm, You're being controlling here, 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 here. Okay. So uh, that's kind of the difference between the nobody's perfect and the um, uh, people we're concerned about is that pattern. And I'll get back to the pattern a little bit later. Another tricky thing is that most abusive behavior is intrinsically abusive. I talk about there's no nice way to say fuck you. Hey, fuck you. Hey, why don't you go fuck yourself, okay? You know, no matter how you say it, it's, it's intrinsically disrespectful. It's intended to be. That's why we use the word fuck rather than saying flower. You know, go flower off. Go flower yourself. It doesn't work the same way, right? Controlling behaviors are typically not intrinsically controlled, okay? It depends on how you use it, okay? So we already talked a little bit earlier about apologizing, okay? So an apology, and you'll notice that on the list of controlling behaviors is apologizing. An apology is not intrinsically controlling. It becomes controlling when it's ingenuine, when I, I do it to, to get you to do something. Okay. For example, let's say that, and all these examples that I'm giving where I'm kind of talking about myself are all made up unless I say otherwise. Okay, so hopefully you all figured that out already. Uh, I'm not telling true stories. I mean, it is true that I do interrupt it. That was a true self-disclosure, but like this is another example of something that's made up. Let's say that I say to, say to my partner, you know, for having a master's degree, you sure can be stupid at times. Just can't believe. And now they got their feelings hurt. And now they don't want to go out to dinner with me. And I was really looking forward to going out to dinner with them. I really wanted to. Now they got their feelings hurt. And honestly, I think they can be kind of dumb at times. But I want to go out to dinner. So guess what I do? Honey, I'm sorry. You know, you're not stupid. Can we go out to dinner now? So of course, I'm not doing this very elegantly, but you get the, hopefully you get the point. The reason why I apologize in that situation is not because I regret what I said or think that it was wrong. Um, I just want to go out to dinner. And I know that if I apologize and make you feel better, you'll go out to dinner with me. Not because I think I did anything wrong, but because I want to go out to dinner. That's an example where I've turned that apology into a controlling behavior. Okay. 
So anything can be twisted into a controlling behavior, anything. Um, and again, if we had more time, I could give examples of, of how to be, uh, how anything can be twisted, all right? So the list of controlling behaviors in that way is infinite, okay? Um, I'll touch a little bit here on anger. Uh, I'll talk about anger some more in the next, uh, uh, in two more webinars. I think it's in the third one about anger. Um, anger is not a cause of abuse. Okay, it is a symptom of the mindset that causes abuse. Anger is not a cause of abuse. It is a symptom of the mindset that causes abuse. Okay, and one of the times it shows up commonly is my frustration when the world won't fucking cooperate with me, when I'm trying to control my partner, I'm trying to control my kids and they're not being controlled by me and I get frustrated and angry, okay? So it's a symptom, it's not a cause. It's also a euphemism, all right? So I'll get back to anger a little bit later again. So here's a great example, and this is a therapy focused one, so it's relevant in that way. It's from Life and Hell by Matt Groening, who's originally from Portland. It also came up with The Simpsons, if you, the, the drawing style looks familiar. So you've got a couples counselor here who's working with two men who are in an abusive relationship, and they're going to try couples counseling. And this will illustrate two things. One is how they can twist things into tools of abuse and control. And secondly, why you shouldn't do couples counseling with people who are abusive. Boys, 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 the couples counselor says, you've got to stop this destructive cycle of hurtful conflict. Let's begin the healing process by beginning each sentence with right now, I feel. That's a great recommendation. The classic thing is an I feel statement. I feel statements. We all learn them. We learn to use them. It's good communication. So here we've got these two abusive men. And this is also an unusual situation where they're both abusive. Um, that's more unusual. Typically, only one of the two of them would be. But this is the way the, the comic's driven, so you, written so you can see this. Right now, I feel hurt that there's so much blaming in our relationship. Good. Right now, I feel hurt when I'm not understood. Nicely put. Right now, I feel hurt that I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Um, right now, I feel hurt that you don't understand the depth of my contempt for you. Careful now. Right now, I feel hurt that you don't realize how much I hate your lousy guts. Oh, my. Right now, I feel hurt that I have to look at your ugly face. This is not. Right now, I feel hurt that I have to restrain myself from strangling. Please, you must. Right now, I feel hurt that I'm going to have to smash your head in. No, no, that's not. Right now, I feel hurt that you're going to force me to beat the living daylights out of you. Stop it! The couple's counselor finally yells. I can't stand listening to this. <coughs> I give up. You guys are hopeless. And it ends with a fist bump. We triumph again. Another couple's counselor bites the dust. Okay. So what these guys have done, and, and in this case, they both have this pro-abuse belief system, is they're taking a good tool and they're twisting it into a weapon. They're weaponizing the I feel statement. Okay. A common way in the real world that we see this happening is... Um, I feel so, and, and I'm sure this has happened. Again, this is right now made up, but I'm sure things very similar to this have happened. I've heard of them from people in my own groups. I say to my partner, honey, right now I feel like you're acting like a bitch. Excuse me? I said, right now I feel like you're acting like a bitch. You're being verbally abusive. I'm being verbally abusive. No, I'm using the I feel statement. What do you mean I'm being verbally abusive? So here I am. You want me to go to a program. I'm going to analyze and change. One of the things that are teaching in the group is I feel. Right here on the journal, it says I feel. So I'm trying to use an I feel statement. I'm going, I'm trying to do this right. And you're still saying I'm doing it wrong, right? So you're saying that they're teaching me to be abusive. You're saying that I feel statements are abusive. Is that what you're saying? I just can't win with you. It doesn't matter how hard I try. It's never good enough. Why do I even try, right? And so my partner is like, no, 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 no. I'm glad you're going. No, I want you to. And no, no, I think an I feel statement. It's just that, you know, it's just, um, it's just, okay, okay, wait, just, all right. Okay, fine. So you feel that I'm acting like a bitch when I do what? Okay. So let's be clear here that if you look at a list of feeling words, like a bitch is not going to be on that list of feeling words. Okay. Like a bitch is not an emotion. So in this example, I'm twisting the I feel statement and turning it into uh, verbal abuse, okay? So um, that's one reason why I gave you this example. The second though, is what is the experience of the partner? This is the crazy making that is so common, okay? Her heart is saying this is wrong. Her heart saying, 
well, but it is an I feel statement. Her heart is saying, this is cool. Her head is saying, but he's going to allies and change. This is the crazy making that is so common when you are in an abusive relationship on the receiving end. Your experience has been continually denied and invalidated and dismissed. Okay, so that also captures that very well, I think. Okay, all righty. So I'm gonna show you a series of photos. These are by Donna Ferrado who uh, came out with a book, again, about 25 years ago called Living with the Enemy. Um, and uh, these are not staged. These are unstaged photos. So Ferrado was on assignment. Um, there was a profile being done to this man named Garth and in a magazine. And you know he was a successful executive uh, in, early in the computer industry. You can see kind of the older computer behind him that would have been brand new at that time. And these are the kinds of photos they were looking for, the happy, successful, wealthy, well-dressed couple, right? So she actually stayed with him for a night or two. You know, she was kind of just to, to get a bunch of photos. And uh, the night that she was there, she heard in the middle of the night uh, altercation happening in the bathroom. And she did what any good photojournalist would do. She grabbed her photo her camera and started taking photos. And this is what she captured. So what's happened is that Garth has a, crack cocaine addiction and Lisa has hidden his crack pipe to, to save the marriage. And Garth is wanting to get his crack pipe. So first he uses an emphatic gesture, okay? And you can see in the mirror here, you can see in the background, Donald Ferrado snapping away. When that doesn't work, he threatens to burn her fur coat. Here's an example of culturally specific abuse. If you're very wealthy, you can threaten to destroy extremely expensive items. Okay, like a fur coat, which could cost thousands of dollars. When that doesn't work, he starts going through her stuff, which is a violation of her space. Now you can see now she's becoming increasingly distraught. She's holding her head in her hands. And then when that doesn't work, he goes old school and he slaps her and then pins her up on the counter. Okay. And then uh, the last photo, same couple, different situation. She's actually gone to the ER because she was injured by him, got the injury address, came home, and awaiting her when she came home was this, Lisa, I love you, and I will do so forever. I am so happy that you are back home, your husband. And then there's a big bouquet of flowers there, roses, and then you can see one of their children photobombing the, the photo. Okay. So what this shows you, the reason why I want to show you these is this shows you the kind of evolving way that abusive behavior is done, okay? And so I wanna kind of make a couple points here. Some of you may have heard about the cycle of violence, okay? The cycle of violence uh, was developed by Lenore Walker way back in the day, 30 plus years ago, 30, maybe even 35 years ago. Um, I think it was The Battered Woman, I think was the title of her book, I believe. So, but she came up with a cycle of violence and uh, uh, I, um, like uh, others have become critical of the cycle of violence. And I think it's an example where she got, uh, Walker got good data. She interviewed a bunch of abused women, but kind of like an a, a amateur anthropologist, uh, archeology, you know, she, she put the bones together the wrong way. So the classic cycle of abuse is there's an outburst, there's uh, a honeymoon after the outburst, there's tension that builds, and then there's another outburst. And um, I don't think that's a, accurate characterization. What I think actually the data she got shows the shifting form of abusive behavior. At its worst, it's obvious and in your face, so to speak. That's the physical abuse, the ugly verbal abuse. That's the outburst stage, okay? Then it will shift, but it can also be much more subtle and insidious, much more manipulative. The empty promises, the ingenuine apologies, the gifts with strings attached. And then a lot of it is that kind of that radiating of intensity, that subtle threatening or not so subtle threatening. And it doesn't always follow the stage of outburst, honeymoon, tension building, outburst, honeymoon. You can skip over a stage. You can stay in one a long time. So again, she was a pioneer and that's true for anybody who's a pioneer. They're not going to, you know, they don't have the, the shoulders of others to stand upon. And so they don't see as far. And so we've evolved since then. So I don't think the cycle of violence is a helpful way of talking about that. Um, because it implies that the abuse only happens at one time, the outburst. And there's this whole honeymoon time, which is so great. And no, there may be some relief 
because it's not so stormy, but there's still manipulation going on. There's still uh, control going on. It's just not as ugly and obvious, okay? So that's a little bit about that. Okay, so I'm gonna shift now to talking about the pattern. And this is a really important part of what we need to understand is this pattern piece. Very important. Again, when I was first getting started in this field back in the early 90s, I heard some experts talk about domestic violence could involve a single incident. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's often a pattern. I would disagree with that. It can never be a single incident. It is never a single incident. It is never a single incident. There's always a pattern there, okay? And again, I think we've evolved in our work. So nobody's perfect. Any of us could have a moment of acting poorly, right? And maybe some of you have, right? And what do you do when you act poorly? You, you know, you, 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 <laughs> oh shoot, I really screwed up. What a knucklehead I was. I'm so sorry. No, of course I, that was not okay. Of course it wasn't okay. And you, and you realize it, you get it, and you stop doing it. It's that easy, right? That's the nobody's perfect kind of thing. And that could be any of us, okay? Um, what I would say is that's hurtful behavior. That's not abusive behavior. It's hurtful behavior. It's not abusive behavior. Okay. So um, let me kind of clarify this. And, and this is something that doesn't get talked about as much. Um, and this is also where, you know, we're trying to use more person-focused language. Um, and so I talk about abusive partners and abused partners, for example, is the language that I use. Some of the language that's being used is people who cause harm. And I actually have an issue with that language because I think we all cause harm at times. I cause harm at times, okay? That's not the same thing as somebody who's being abusive. So hurtful behavior, which we all do at times, refers to unintentionally causing harm to another. What causes that is an accident. We make an assumption that there's not to be wrong. We misunderstand. We're, we, you know, we just aren't, we aren't being our best selves. We get caught up in, our, in ourselves when we're neglectful. Those are just some examples that happen. Inevitably, if you're in a relation, in a close relationship, you're going to be hurtful at times and you're going to get hurt at times. It's inevitable. That's not domestic violence. Hurtful behavior is never done on purpose or it's intentionally done. And it's not intentionally done to cause harm or to control. Typically, to the extent that we can, when this is pointed out, we acknowledge it and we change what we do. Okay. So here are some examples of hurtful behavior stepping on someone's toe. Um, the most common example I give is if you dance closely with somebody, uh, sometimes you can get your foot stepped on, okay? That's causing harm, right? Giving somebody a present that's not right for them, forgetting you were supposed to do something for somebody, showing up late, touching them in a way they don't want to be touched, though you wouldn't have known that in advance. So how are you doing? I touch somebody on the shoulder and, and they flinch. That was me being hurtful. I wasn't being abusive. I truly was trying to comfort this person. I thought that would be okay. But for this person, that wasn't okay. That was hurtful, okay? Snoring, okay? And, and uh, honestly, I do snore. So I, I will own that as an honest behavior. And at times with certain, you know, with certain partners, it's kept them up. That's hurtful to them. Now, I'm not trying to keep them up. It isn't part of my agenda to snore, but it is causing harm, even though I'm not intending to cause harm, right? Uh, misplacing an item that's shared, damaging or breaking something that belongs to somebody. You know, these are examples of hurtful behaviors, right? So let me contrast hurtful versus abusive. Hurtful is inadvertent and is not intended to cause harm. Abuse is done willfully to cause harm or to control. Hurtful behaviors often, not always, but often quickly acknowledged and known. Abusive behaviors often denied and minimized. Um, hurtful behavior, we do our best to manage it as well as we can. Abusive behavior continues unabated. Okay. Everyone is occasionally hurtful, but only a subset of people, thankfully, are abusive. Okay. Have patterns of abuse and control. All right. So uh, I tend to be a shades of gray kind of person in terms of thinking about things and their nuances. So talking about um, uh, making strong black and white statements is rare for me. 
so I want to acknowledge that this is a very strong statement because I think it accurately captures what actually happens. Abusive behavior is always a choice. Abusive behavior is always a choice. There are lots of things that can trigger abusive behavior, being stressed, losing your job, getting drunk, having a trauma response, but none of these things cause the abuse, okay? So the way it's common within the field, we talk about this, is people who are abusive give themselves permission to be abusive. I do this all the time. You gave yourself permission to call her a name. You gave yourself permission to lie to her, okay? Non-abusive behavior, people do not give themselves permission to be abusive, okay? So another way of thinking about this, the analogy is you can think about it as having a firearm, okay? And in this analogy, your pro-abuse belief system is like the firearm, okay? If I own a firearm, there's lots of things that could lead me to shoot that firearm. I could be hunting. Somebody could be invading my home and I could shoot. Um, uh, I could be scared by somebody and I could shoot. I could be depressed and I could shoot myself, right? But if I don't own a firearm, I can't shoot anything in anybody. I may still get stressed out. I may still have a home invader. Uh, I might still feel very depressed. But if I don't have a firearm, I can't shoot anybody, okay? So my point here, um, and uh, uh, this is one to feel hardened by, is uh, there is so much suffering in this world. There is so much injustice in this world. There are so many things that are done wrong, and most people respond to those injustices with nonviolence. Most people that are mistreated do not respond to their mistreatment with violence. They choose not to be abusive, okay? So very important. So there, and of course we see this in a gendered way. Um, one dark extreme example are mass shootings. Uh, the vast majority of mass shootings are done by men. Okay? Men who have been rejected, men who have been fired, men who are outcasts, uh, men who feel wronged. Um, and these are all men who in those moments have given themselves permission to kill other people. There are lots of women and some men who are fired, treated unjustly, rejected, outcasts, and they don't weapon up and go out and kill a bunch of people, okay? So it's not the stress or the mental illness or anything like that. It's the, the giving themselves permission, okay? It's about giving yourself permission, okay? Um, all righty. So a couple other nuances, and hopefully this is not getting a little too nuanced, um, and hopefully this is understandable. People who are prone to abuse are quick to see others as against them. And so what happens is if I'm an abusive partner, the moments that my partner is being hurtful, in other words, they're inadvertently hurting me, I'm going to interpret as acts of aggression. And typically, as I see myself being aggressed against, I fire back to defend myself. Okay. So people who are prone to abuse are quick to misperceive their partner's hurtful behavior as being abusive. Okay. On the other hand, people who are being abused, especially early in the process, are quick to assume that the abusive behavior is hurtful and inadvertent. I mean, he called me a name last night, but he had a tough day and, you know, he just, he just had it off. I, I don't think it's that big a deal. Okay. However, as it persists over time, it becomes more evident that what I thought was hurtful behavior is actually abusive behavior as it forms a pattern. Okay. So again, a way of understanding this is if, you know, if my, my uh, dating partner gets drunk one night, are they an alcoholic? Or do they just have one night of getting drunk? We'll see. Time will tell. Because if they're an alcoholic, they'll get drunk over and over again or struggle with alcohol use over and over again. If they're not an alcoholic, this was a one and done kind of thing. You know, once every six months they get drunk. That's it. So that's probably where it can take some time to see whether it's a pattern or not. Okay. So another part of the pattern thing. Um, is, uh, and of course, inevitably, this almost always happens. I'm not gonna get through all my slides. 
Um, I'll get through as much of this as I can, but you have all the slides to, to see. Um, but I will just kind of plug along as far as I can get. Um, this pattern thing is a real tipping point. I would say this is the key tipping point is this pattern. Because once you have a pattern, you create an environment. And the, the phrase that I've coined to describe this is the bully effect, okay? So once there's a pattern, what this means is that even typically non-abusive behavior is experienced by the family as being abusive. And let me explain the analogy that I'm using here. So um, when I was growing up, and I'm assuming this is still true to this day, but when I was a kid, there were schoolyard bullies. There were a few kids that were bullies. And what the bullies would do is they would publicly beat up a few kids. And then once they, but then once they established themselves as a bully, anything they did, you get afraid of, right? So if the bully walked by me, I get afraid. The bully sit by me, I get afraid. If the bully looks at you, you get afraid, right? The bully may not be thinking about hurting you. They may not even hurt you. It doesn't matter. Just them being around you would put you on edge. This is what happens in abusive relationships is once a pattern of abusive behavior has been established, just the way they walk through the house, just their presence can put the family on edge, okay? So it's not just the abuse of the self, it's the aftermath of the abuse, it's the anticipation of further abuse. And so what this creates is a family that's continually vigilant and hypervigilant, either anticipating or fearing when is gonna be the next abusive episode, okay? There's this monitoring going on, okay? So let me go back to that example, the tires, the sound of the tires in the driveway. Does he pull the car in nice and slow and the tires come in very quietly? Is he, is he? Okay, let's, let's see how he does when he walks through the door. Okay, he's smiling and friendly. Okay, we're okay, right? So, so that again, he hasn't even done anything, but you're kind of monitoring and wondering what's going on, what's gonna happen, okay? So here's one more analogy to better understand this. Um, each act of abuse and control is like a single wire in a cage. Looked at individually, they don't seem particularly intimidating but put all the wires together and you are confined. When you look closely, you see only the one wire. Pull back and you will see the cage. So this is how you can understand somebody who's never in fear of their lives can be absolutely terrorized in a relationship where there's no physical abuse, let's say, okay? It's all these other, the, the culmination of all these other forms of abuse all together, okay? So now we're gonna kind of get to kind of the more foundational figuratively and in some ways literally, which is a pro-abuse belief system. The reason why there are patterns of abuse and there are inevitably patterns is because of pro-abuse belief system, okay? And this is where we need to evolve in the way we address domestic violence. We need to stop focusing so much on the behaviors and instead focus more on changing the underlying belief systems, okay? If you don't, um, address the underlying belief systems. If you just stop the behavior without changing the beliefs, new abusive and controlling behaviors will appear, okay? So here's my analogy of the DV house, okay? Which will bring together several of these things. The physical abuse and the ugly verbal abuse is like the chimney and the smoke. It's the highest up, so you can see from far away, kind of like those mountains, but that's not what this house is built out of. The bulk of this house is built out of drywall or wood or stone. That's the emotional abuse, the psychological abuse, the controlling behaviors. That's the bricks and the mortar of the house. That's the bulk of the house, okay? The physical abuse, the extreme abuse, that's just the tip, just the chimney. But this house is built on a belief set, okay? And certain pro-abuse beliefs. If you stop the behavior without changing the beliefs, it's like building a new house and a bad foundation. Even though it's a new house, it will crumble much more quickly, okay? So ultimately the work we're trying to do with abusive partners is not just stopping their behaviors, it's changing their ways they think in the world, their belief system. That's the tall order, that's the challenge that we're trying to do, okay? And so here's a, this is a quote that's been said in various ways for millennia, but here's a more contemporary version from Stephen Covey author of the Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. We see the world not as it is, but as we are, or as we are conditioned to see it. When we open our mouths to describe what we see, we in effect describe ourselves, our perceptions, our paradigms. What I would say unites 
pretty much all abusive partners is their belief systems. They have pro-abuse belief systems. And that's the fundamental change that has to happen, is changing those belief systems, okay? If you don't change the belief systems, even if they stop certain behaviors, other ones will crop up. And we see this happen all the time. The most clear and striking example is most of our court mandated folks, as soon as they engage in our programs, they stop their physical abuse. They stop their physical abuse by like that. Like that. Virtually, it's, it's very unusual that a person who's court mandated in our program does physical abuse while they're in our program. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's very unusual. It's not because we do amazing work and we can immediately help them change. It's because they know they're being watched, right? They're on probation. Uh, people have eyes on them. So they're going to stop their physical abuse. And they can that easily, okay? Uh, what they continue or even escalate is their verbal and emotional abuse. So those who are still having contact with their partners, we hear this all the time for the partners. They've confirmed that the physical abuse has stopped. And they also confirm that the emotional non-physical abuse continues often or escalates. Or it changes the shape. They become a little bit nicer, but they're still quite controlling. It doesn't feel like anything's changed. These are very common quotes I hear from survivors, from the abused partners who are still in relationship. Okay. So we really need to shift our whole way of doing public awareness around domestic violence to be blunt about it. Behavior is relevant, but it's just the flower and the dandelion. The roots are the belief system. We need to be talking more about these belief systems. That's what we need to be focusing on. And so here's dandelions, right? And the idea of if you see a dandelion and you pull the flower out, it's gone, right? No, it's not. It's still there. And if you don't pull up the roots, more dandelions will appear. Uh, in Oregon, we have an issue with blackberry bushes, which are vines and thorny and same thing. You can cut the vines, but they have extensive root systems. If you don't pull the roots up, you're not, gonna, you're not going to uh, uh, really stop them. That's what we need to change. Are the roots are the belief systems, okay? So you pick or mow dandelion blossoms, the plants will make more flowers, all right? That's the same thing. So they, they swap out one form of abuse with another form of abuse, okay? All right. Okay. So belief systems. Um, I want to highlight the most common belief system. And I'm going to mention another book here that is still, even though it's, it's a book that's been around for a long time, it's still the best book. So in my opinion, and again, if you all have other opinions, please put them in the chat or what have you. But still to this day, I think the best book out there for people who have been abused is The Verbally Abusive Relationship by Patricia Evans. Okay. It came out about 30 years ago, the first edition did. It's still in print and new editions have come out. They're just slight revisions. It's still the best book. Uh, she does the best job of anybody I've seen saying, talking about the difference between power over, which is the belief system of people who are abusive and personal power. And I'm gonna cover this for you now so that you can better understand this, okay? You also, your next handout, and so if we're gonna be sending handouts through chat, this would be the next handout is a breakdown briefly of Patricia Evans's power over versus personal power, okay? So um, power over, um, okay, is um, this idea of either you're right or you're wrong. You either win or you lose. We either do it my way or we do it your way. So there's somebody on top and somebody in the bottom. There's somebody up and somebody down. So it's an either or way of thinking, okay? Now, in this way of thinking, there's an external focus, okay? If you and I disagree, part of me proving myself right is proving you wrong. If you and I are in a race, part of me winning is getting you to lose, is beating you, okay? So there's an external focus. This external focus is key. This outward focus is key, okay? Now, with this outward focus comes blame, okay? This idea that the reason why I'm unhappy is because of what you did or what you said or what you didn't do or what you didn't say, okay? Now, another aspect of a power over is there's an assumption of scarcity. There can only be one person who gets their way. There can only be one winner. There can be only one right answer, okay? So with this outward focus, with this view of others as being against, it's natural to be abusive and controlling. I need to control you. I need to dominate you. I can submit to you and you can get your way or I can dominate you and get my way, but it's one or the other. So in power over, others are quick to be seen as opposed or as opponents. Okay. 
Diversity is also a threat in power over, okay? If I believe A and you believe B, I see your differing belief as a threat to me, and I've got to get you to stop having that belief. So differences are seen as threats, okay? All right. There are two spots in power over. This is an important thing to understand. One's in the one up spot, but the other's in the one down spot, okay? People in power over are often feeling like they're in the one down spot, okay? So um, let me show you a couple quick cartoons to further illustrate this. Um, here's a one up, one down view of how we kind of compare ourselves, this comparative process. Um, it's kind of another way to think about this is zero sum. In order for one side of the seesaw to go up, the other side needs to go down. That's zero sum thinking. So here's an example of this. Ratbert says to Dilbert, the goal of all creatures is to be happy, and I'm happier than you are. We can conclude that I'm more successful than you are. Isn't that right? You are really starting to annoy me now. The gap widens. Yes. So again, the more annoyed you become, the less happy you are. So your side of the seesaw goes down, which lifts me up. So by comparison, I'm happier. In other words, going fast means I'm going faster than you. I am passing you. Going slow means you're passing me. Okay. All right. So that's kind of that external focus. Okay. So the uh, second example, this is the one down spot. So Dilbert says to his coworker, is this number accurate? It seems low. And she replies, why are you attacking me? Stop attacking me. Okay, I think the number is low. It's too late to apologize. Now I hate your guts. So to be clear here, in this cartoon, the person who's in power over is the woman coworker. She's seen herself in the one down spot. He's simply trying to go and ask her a question, peer to peer, but she sees it as he's trying to control her. And so she needs to counter strike. So she's the one who's in power over. So whether you're in the one up spot or in the one down spot, either spot you're in power over, okay? So that's power over. Now Evans calls us reality one because this isn't just the way I see the world. This is the way I think the world is. This is the way everybody is, okay? It's not just that I'm in power over. I believe everybody's in power over, most of all my partner, okay? So hopefully that's clear enough. Um, power over is very much a part of our culture, especially for male folk. Um, how do you know you're a good student? You score, you're higher up on the curve. You do better than other students do. This is why we hate the geeks who study hard and pull the curve up and like the slackers who pull the curve down. How do you know you're a good athlete? Because you win the race, because you're a winner and not a loser, because your team beats the other team. How do you know you have a good job? Because you're higher up on the power sheet because you make more money than other people do. So academically, athletically, professionally, power over very, is very much the norm. Yeah, Janie, you got something you wanna voice or share? Um, Douglas Marlowe asks, um, asks you, Chris, if it's relevant, um, he, he'd love to hear you articulate the difference between control and power as they seem to be used interchangeably. Right, right. So uh, I think that another way of thinking, sometimes the idea they use power to control. So control is referring to behaviors. Control is about controlling behaviors. So somebody is controlling, that's the way they're acting. Power refers to the person's mindset. So power is the attitude. It's really a power orientation. So power is referring to the belief system and control is referring to the behaviors that the person does. Okay. Now I want to make it clear that you can have this power over belief set and have very little power in real life. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, so for example, I can be in power over and be a janitor. Okay. Now I'm not going to use power over with my boss. <laughs> I'm not going to use power over with the people who occupy the space that I clean because they have more power than me. Guess who I'm going to use power over with? Okay. My partner and my kids. Okay, so um, that's kind of the difference, if you will. Yeah, Janie, something else? Uh, Christopher Godsey asks, does power also have to do with agency? Um, 
Well, there, there's a complicated interaction with that. And, and it's a great question. Um, uh, it's really about where can I get away with dominating? So, um, and this is what we see. I mean, one of the reasons why most abusive men are only abusive in the home is because that's where they can get away with it, okay? Um, and uh, typically, and I can't remember, um, I talk about this a little bit later in the slide, is we talk about the idea of being hostage to the abuse. So one of the things that keeps people in abusive relationships is they're basically a hostage. And that means the person who's being abusive has some kind of power over me. And maybe they may be physically stronger than me. They may be a whole lot smarter than me. They make a whole lot more money than I make, but in some way they've got their hooks into me, okay? Um, and uh, so for example, let's say that, um, you know, I'm uh, uh, 16 years old and I uh, am, 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 you know, prone to sexual abuse. As a 16 year old, I can try to sexually abuse my adult high school teacher but they have more power than I do. They can easily set boundaries with me. If I target my eight-year-old sibling, they don't have power over me. So part of this, I mean, that's the agency part of it, if you will, in part, is, is where can I get away with it? That's why part of stopping domestic violence is empowering women in part, given that women are the most common targets of violence. In general, it's empowering the victims of violence. Um, Usually, the more disempowered people are, the easier it is to victimize them. That's why the homeless um, and sex workers are two of the most common targets for violence, because they are, they're relatively disempowered in our culture, for example. Okay, so good questions. Lots more we could do, and I've got uh, about 25 minutes left. So um, personal power is the alternative to power over. Okay, so in personal power, the idea is you can be right and I can be right. You can get what you want, and I can get what, you, what I want. You can win, and I can win. So there's an assumption of abundance. There can be many winners, many right answers. All needs can be met. It comes from an assumption of abundance. Where does this abundance come from? An internal focus. It comes from an internal focus. This is one of the key things about personal power is an internal focus, okay? So um, the idea then is that, um, so how does this look? You know, um, uh, academically, what this means is I want to learn the material. Now, sure, I'd like to get an A. I'm going to do my best to get an A. But get an A or not, what's more important is I understand the material well. So you want to borrow my chemistry notes? Yeah, you can borrow them. If you have any questions, ask me. I'm happy to kind of offer you guidance. I know that doing so may, may lead you to get a better grade, which will affect my grade. I get that, but also, in, in, you know, um, we're all here to learn, okay? <clears throat> um, and uh, athletically, um, it's not that I can't be competitive. I'm going to try to win the race, but mainly I just love to want, run. To win or lose, I had fun. I mean, I, I got second. You were an incredible runner, the person who won. I was just amazed. You challenged me. And I think that's not a coincidence that I had one of my best times running against you. It was an incredible race, wasn't it? That's personal power. I'm not a loser. I finished second. So what? It was an incredible race. I finished eighth. So what? It was amazing. Right? Or professionally, do I take pride in my work? Do I love what I do? Do I see the value of what I do? You know, I may just be a custodian at this big old university here, but these professors, they're doing very important research. They're teaching, creating our future leaders and scientists and they shouldn't be have to spend their time in a disorganized, messy space. I mean, that's what I can do. You know, I may not be the brightest of men. You know, I hardly made it through high school even, but I take pride in what I do. I feel like I'm helping out. You know, I'm, keep, I'm doing what I can to help grow the next generation of great minds. That's a personal vow, power view of being a custodian. Okay. All right. So here's the, and then, and then diversity is respected in personal power. Your difference is not a threat to me. I don't have to prove you wrong to prove me right. We can simply agree to disagree. We can simply have different perspectives. So I'm not focused on making you something that you're not or getting you to see, right? In order for a relationship to be in personal power, both people need to be in personal power. In order for a relationship to be in personal power, both people need to be in personal power. If one of the two people is in power over, so goes the relationship, okay? 
And that's what we see. It's very unusual, very unusual that both people are in power over. Almost always, like 90% of the time or more, only one of the two people is in power over. But that's all it takes. You cannot be collaborative if the person beside you is not willing to be collaborative with you. Okay. So um, I'm going to touch on this more in the next webinar. But one of the common mistakes people across the world make is they assume every relationship is collaborative. The mistake that every couples counselor makes is they assume that every relationship is collaborative. It's such an assumption they don't even assess for it, right? It's it, you, just like you assume people are breathing. You know, you assume people have a heartbeat. You assume people are collaborative. So I don't ask you. So are you breathing? So do you have a heartbeat? So does it feel like you're on the same team? The first two questions, maybe it's obvious why we don't ask them. The third question doesn't get asked either because there's an assumption of collaboration. And guess what? The majority of the time you're right. The couple, actually with couples counseling, it's not even the majority, but a fair amount of the time you're right. They're collaborative. And certainly many of other relationships are. In a power over relationship, it's not collaborative. Okay. Um, and that's, I think, a key thing. So um, personal power. A flower does not think of competing with a flower next to it. It just blooms. All right. So also in power over the truths with a capital tree. There are right ways and wrong ways. Okay. Personal power, there are many truths. And here's a great example. A cylinder will cast a shadow that makes it look like a circle or like a square or rectangle, depending on which way you shine the light. So what is it? Is it a circle? Is it a square? Is it a rectangle? Is it a cylinder? Is it a sphere? Is it a cube? Who's right and who's wrong? Right? Depends on your perspective. Okay. So, I think, so there are other pro-abuse belief systems, but I think this idea of power over versus personal power captures the most common aspect of this. The other way I talk about this, which is so core, is that people who are prone to being abusive have an external focus. They are externally focused, outwardly focused. That's extremely common, which is consistent with power over. So a lot of the work we're trying to do is to help people shift from power over to personal power. And that is somewhat cultural, especially for men or for male identified people. That's a lot of what we need to do, okay? And so the final bit of domestic violence is it's not being done to strangers, it's being done to an intimate partner. Um, I'm gonna share with you this cartoon because I haven't talked a lot about the suffering. And I think this cartoon captures in a, in a few words, a, a little bit of the suffering that victims of domestic violence experience. You say you love me, yet you undermine me. You say you love me, yet you invalidate my feelings. You say you love me, yet you crush my hopes. You say you love me, yet you mock my sincerity. You say you love me, yet you dismiss my worries. You say you love me, yet you destroy my trust. You say you love me, yet you deceive me. You say you love me, yet you confuse my mind. I never said I love you. This is what it's like to be in an abusive relationship. You know, it's, you know, we can put locks on doors. We can talk about stranger danger. We can organize neighborhood watches. But what do you do when the person who's most terrorizing you is sleeping in the bed beside you? Shares your home, shares your life. This is domestic violence, okay? So why is it that people who are abusive target their partner? Uh, the, the simplest answer I've heard given, and I have mixed feelings about this, is well, because they can. And what that means is there are fewer immediate sanctions. If I call my the wait staff a fucking assholes, they may not serve me. Right? If I call my boss a fucking asshole, they may fire me. If I call the police officer a fucking asshole, they may arrest me. But I can call my partner and my kids fucking assholes. And what the fuck are they going to do? Leave me? You think anybody else is going to want to be with you? Right? Again, it's just part of my larger arsenal of ways of keeping them. Uh, leverage is another common part of that. Um, almost always there's some kind of leverage or something that's keeping the partner or victim in the relationship. And um, there's another hand I'll talk about briefly here in just a moment around that. Um, there's a sense of entitlement this, that, that this is my partner. This is why you take, when we get married, you take my last name. Because I put my name on all my stuff, and you're part of my stuff. That's why kids get my last name too, because they're part of my stuff. So there's that sense of entitlement. 
that, that you own your partner. Um, some other reasons are greater emotional investment. The person I'm the most vulnerable with, not that I'm even vulnerable much with her, but still in a relative way, for most of us, the person we're most vulnerable with is our romantic partner. And so they can also hurt us the most. They can cause us the great pain, greatest pain. If I'm in power over, I'm gonna misinterpret your hurt as abuse and I defend myself against your abuse, right? Um, and uh, another aspect of domestic violence that doesn't get talked about a lot, that I think is very common, is projection of distress, externalizing of distress. So control is one reason why people are abusive and have patterns of abuse. Another is they externalize their distress. They take the, the dis-ease that is in, inside of them and they vomit it out onto the people who are closest to them, which is my partner and my kids. Okay? So I think these are reasons why the partners most typically they get targeted. So types of abusive men, because um, I've only got about uh, 15 minutes left, I'm gonna skip through this quickly. Um, the main takeaway is that abusive men are not all the same. It gets even more complicated with abusive women. Uh, Janie uh, runs several of our groups for women. Um, uh, and I don't have a lot of time to talk about this. This goes beyond 201 talking. But if you wanna understand the complexities of women and abuse, you're welcome to talk to myself or Janie on the side. Um, and we can talk about that. But I wanna talk about men. Amy Holtzworth Monroe, who's a researcher from the Midwest, I think from maybe Indiana, came out with this research, which is very well regarded. And she's done up multiple studies on this. And this fits very much with my lived experience uh, working with thousands of these guys. Three categories of abuse have been, okay? Um, the first are what I call family only. As the name implies, they're only abusive in the home. Typically, these individuals do not have significant histories of trauma. One common mischaracterization of abusive men is they are all trauma survivors. That is not the case. A significant subset are trauma survivors, yes, but some do not have any significant childhood trauma in them. They mainly fall into this group here, okay? They tend to be less severe with their abusive behavior. They tend to be do more passive aggressive kind of stuff. They do not have pro-social values in general. They're not very sexist. They can be very enlightened in many ways, that kind of thing. They typically do not, have criminal histories, they don't have a risk histories. They're, they could be outwardly very likable people. About half of all abusive men fall into this category, family only, okay? This group gets overlooked a lot because they're less extreme, they're less dangerous to everybody else. Um, they can come across much more pleasantly and nicely, but half fall into that category. Uh, abuse intervention programs don't see a lot of these guys. They see some, but not as many as out there because they're mainly working with court involved people. When you start working with people who are not court involved, you can see more of these folks, okay? Second group are psychologically distressed and dependent abusive men. They tend to, uh, their abuse tends to ebb and flow. There'll be periods of time when they're more abusive and periods of time when they're less abusive. They tend to be much more enmeshed in the relationship, much more emotionally dependent on their partner. She's his sun, his moon, his stars, his everything. So because of this, they're more possessive and more jealous. Um, many of these individuals do have trauma histories as children, and they have an anxious attachment. So many of these individuals are, um, are not well attached. You could argue they have attachment disorders. Attachment orders do not cause abusive behavior. A pro-abuse belief system does. But attachment disorders can trigger abusive behavior, if you will. Okay. They, can, they often have co-occurring mental health issues, depression, anxiety, what have you. They also tend to be more um, struggle with dysregulation because they have that trauma brain. And dysregulation shows up as property abuse, which tends to be more impulsive, being abusive in front of other people rather than being waiting until they're behind closed doors and being self-abusive, okay? And they can be remorseful. That doesn't mean they stop their abuse, but when they're not in such an activated state, they, they, um, they can be, uh, you know, um, not abusive or less abusive. I think this is my addition. This is not Holtz, Holtz with Monroe's research, but I believe the majority of murder suicides, the perpetrators fall into this category here. The abusive partners fall in this category here. They, they feel like they're losing everything because of that enmeshment and that dependency. They can't imagine going on. They become suicidal and they take their partner or their partner and their kids with them. All right. About a quarter of all abusive men fall into this category. And the third one are criminal and generally violent. These are the individuals who have a larger victim pool. They're violating other people's rights as well. 
They're doing other kinds of crime. They're getting other kinds of trouble. They tend to be less dependent on their partners. It's more of a use them and lose them kind of thing. These are the individuals that have the highest criminal risk in general. You know, they're going to be dealing drugs. They're going to be trafficking, uh, doing sex trafficking or trafficking in humans. They're going to be, um, you know, uh, gang involved, things of that nature um, as well. And about a quarter of all abusive men fall into this category. Okay. So um, now I'm going to skip to a few last things in the 10 minutes I've got left. Um, I'm actually doing okay here. Uh, so, but bear with me. And again, you're welcome to follow up with emails with questions. Some of this stuff I'm going to touch on a little bit more in the future webinars. Another reason to come back, um, you can read the book. Although this isn't in the book because this is more about victims and the book is written for abusive men. So one of the most common things that's said about people who are being abused by abuse partners, why doesn't she leave? I would never. Okay, so I come out with a handout. For you all familiar with Paul Simon's song, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, I came out with a handout, 50 Reasons Why Victims Stay, 50 Reasons Why Abuse Partners Stay. And that's the handout that I think has just been, the link has just been shared with you. Now, credit where credit's due, I reviewed a bunch of survivor advocate handouts. So over the years of my training, I got a number of handouts from different survivor services talking about reasons why abused women stay. And so I took all those and I put them all together. I tossed in some additional ideas that I had and I came up with all the reasons, okay? Now, um, uh, this why doesn't she leave is, is a form of victim blaming. Um, and partly why we like blaming victims is if it was the victim's fault and I don't do what the victim did, then I won't get victimized. It's a way of creating this illusion that we're safe, whether we're safe from sexual assault, we're safe from domestic violence, we're safe from being robbed, we're safe from being burglarized. We just don't do what the victims do and we'll be okay. That's the appeal of victim blaming. It helps other them and make us feel safer, artificially safer, by the way. So I think this is part of what's happening with abused partners is that kind of thing. So I think it's very important. We'll talk about this more um, in the third seminar about what to do. You don't focus on helping victims leave. That can be part of what they do to seek safety, but it's very important that you're not the driver of that. And I'll talk about that a lot more in a month in, in the webinar number three, okay? And I wanna help you. It's very important to understand that, again, in my experience, having heard from hundreds of survivors, most survivors don't wanna leave the relationship they want to leave the abuse. They don't want the relationship to end. They want the abuse to end. Their strong preference is I want to keep the relationship and end the abuse. Now, if the only way the abuse is going to end is by me leaving the relationship, then I will potentially do that. Um, but that's not my focus. So that's a very important thing to understand. We also know, by the way, that the most dangerous time, hands down, for victims of domestic violence is as they are leaving or after they have left the relationship. That's where the vast majority of domestic homicides happen. Okay. So it's also a very dangerous thing to do, even if it's the right thing to do. Okay. All right. So um, another thing you could say is why don't we start asking why don't, why doesn't the abusive partner stop? Why doesn't the abusive partner stop? Okay. Well, uh, because they don't need to. Well, they suffer a lot from their abuse as well. I don't have time to go into all that, but the idea that all they benefit, that, that their abuse only benefits them is a propaganda and it's bullshit. They suffer from their abuse as well. It creates suffering for them, but their suffering is longer term. The seduction of abuse and control is it often works in the short run and you pay it for it in the long run if you're the perpetrator. So as the person doing the abuse and control, it may work in the short run but there's significant long-term consequences. But it's easy not to really notice those or pay attention to those, okay? So um, here are many reasons why I fear, and again, if I had more time, I could unpack these for you more, but you've got the handout and you can look at these. Fear of retaliation if they leave, um, uh, fear of harm being done to others, the logistics, do they have a place to go? Um, the leading cause of homelessness among women and children is domestic violence. So leaving may be choosing to flee into homelessness. Um, they may be economically dependent. Um, they may question their own ability to live on their own. That's a common thing that abusive partners do is they really attack the esteem of their partner, um, if you will. Um, 
uh, there may be significant consequences they if they leave, um, which is more than they want to deal with. Um, it's already hard enough. Um, so we could go on. There, there are lots of different reasons why. That's the main thing. There's lots of reasons why. All right. So sorry about the animation. I didn't realize these were still animated. Um, so uh, again, the most common reason um, is that the abuse partner is not able to effectively set limits with the abuse because they are hostage. Okay. There's often a power differential, which makes it uh, hard for them to effectively set limits. Okay. And I've already talked about this a little bit more. Um, this is also why we don't hear about children sexually abusing adults. We don't hear about students sexually abusing teachers, employees sexually harassing supervisors because of um, these power differentials. Okay. All righty. So if I do have power, then I can set boundaries. So I, this has happened. So let me give you a real example of this, not in an intimate relationship, but as a professor, you know, I used to teach a one credit anger management class at Portland State University for many years. And most years there'd be one student that would try to be manipulative to get a different grade, okay? But here's the deal, who has the power in that relationship? I do. So whatever the student's manipulations would be, um, I would tell them, look, I'm not gonna change your grade, period because I have the power, okay? That's an example where if I'm dealing with a manipulative student, it's much easier to manage a manipulative student. Now, on the other hand, if I'm dealing with a manipulative teacher, now they've got some power over me. Now I may need to, you know, if my teacher said, you know, if you want to get an A plus, you need to bring in some baked goods. I love baked goods. I really want to get that better grade. So I do something I really only want to do is I bake something for them, right? They can get away with that because they have the power. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So another thing I want to talk about is um, what I find happens all the time, because again, most abusive partners are only abusive in the home. They are very well behaved everywhere else. One of the things that really surprises people when they encounter people who are abusive is how nice they are and how pleasant they are and how much like regular people they are. It's because they are regular people. Okay. So, um, so we've got John, who's an abuser. John's coworkers think he's a great hard worker. His supervisor loves him. That's why he's got promotions. His neighbors think he's a kind and reasonable neighbor, right? They all think John's great. John can never be like that. You know? The advocate who's worked with Jill for the past six months, supporting her with John's abusive behavior, sees John as nothing but an abuser and a monster. All she's seen is the way she's inflicted suffering on Jill and the children. So he is nothing but a monster to her. The only people who see the full breadth of who John is, is his family. They see both the good and the bad. The fact that he's not just a good man and he's not just a monster. He's a mixture of all these things, okay? And so it's very important we keep this in mind, okay? And the challenge. Because again, my experience, I, you know, I, like I said, I've worked with thousands of abusive partners. Most of them are very nice, respectful, funny, engaged people, right? Most of them are not brutes to me, right? Point of qualifier. All right, and the last couple, I think I got what, about, oh, two minutes left. Okay, so the last couple points I gotta make, very important, and then, and then we'll call it a day, is you need, it's a common mistake mental health professionals make is we think micro. We think about individual people and their suffering or maybe their families and their suffering. You've got to understand the larger macro part of this. Domestic violence exists in part because the culture supports it. Our larger culture supports domestic violence. Not by saying, hey, it's okay for a man to hit a woman, but, but in more subtle ways than that, okay? And um, uh, a great quote, uh, that comes from the movie Spotlight, is if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to abuse one as well, okay? And part of where um, um, I'm going with this is, and part of my anger, I sometimes joke about my Chris's anger bingo card. You've got, you know, we could give out bingo cards with have different squares of what makes Chris angry. One of the things that makes me angry is a level of ignorance about domestic violence among mental health professionals, okay? Um, and this is a great example. 
Um, mental health professionals typically are very poorly trained in domestic violence. And as a result, they don't see it when they're working with it. And as a result of that, they end up colluding with it and enabling it. This is part of the idea that it takes a village to abuse a child. Okay? So part of the larger macro work that needs to be done is we need to raise awareness among mental health professionals, everybody, including mental health professionals about what domestic violence is. So here's the power and control wheel out of Duluth. This is about what an individual will do, but it's nested between the way the institutions deal with this and our larger cultural values. Okay, and I think you've got this handout as well, and then you've got the coordinate community action handout, this one. So what we need to understand is we're serious about stopping, stopping domestic violence. We need to not just do it on an individual level, we need to do it on a social level. And part of that is getting better trained in what it is as a mental health professional. So my hope is that what you will do beyond today is come back and, and get additional training in the next few webinars, but also really apply this the way you practice with your clients and start to see it where you've been missing it before. So the visual of this is we've got all these different parts of our society. And the idea is that as we get better trained and as we work together and coordinate, we create a tighter and tighter web to capture the domestic violence that's happening in our culture, okay? So um, the next webinar, which will be in two weeks, same bat time, same bat station, will be on how to screen for domestic violence. Um, so I hope you all can make that. <clears throat> You're welcome to be in touch with me uh, via email. Um, if you have other questions or other things you wanna share with me, um, that's my email there. I'm happy to respond in the side. Otherwise, um, uh, I need to wrap up because I'm, I'm, I'm at time. And I think Rowan wants to wrap up with a thing or two. So uh, thank you all very much for attending today. Hopefully you'll find this information helpful and useful and applicable in your, in your professional work. Thank you so much for presenting today, Chris. Um, yeah, just before you all leave, I wanted to say real quick that if you are wanting CEUs from this webinar, uh, please uh, submit the evaluation. I dropped the link in the chat. Uh, I'll drop it again in just one moment, but please email that to me uh, at rowan at ocadsfa.org. Again, I'll drop that in the chat again. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Can't wait to see you in two weeks. Uh, Rowan, I, th uh, I think that only, um, that only came to us. So here, let me, let me do it again. Oh, did it? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Oh, good catch. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janie. Right. Um, yeah, I think your email, same thing. Your email only went to um, Janie it? and I. Oh. All right. So um, I'm going to, I just saved the chat. Um, but for some reason, it's not, I asked it to show in Finder. Oh, you did save the chat. That's great. I, well, oh, there's more info. So I'm going to save it again. And then maybe now it'll. Ah, show and finder, please. So you can stop the recording too. Yes. <laughs> okay.